Hello, uh, my name's Steve Hart. So this uh, tech talk is uh, voting methods with Google Votes. And what I'm going to do is talk a bit, it's kind of an introduction to social choice theory, which is all about how groups make decisions, the different uh, methods that people can use to, to vote and to aggregate those votes, both uh, the methods and the algorithms. And I'll go through a number of common voting methods and algorithms and talk about some of their idiosyncrasies. Uh, I'm using the Google Votes voting platform as the example for every, everything in this talk. So I'll start by saying what uh, Google Votes is. So Google Votes is a liquid democracy voting platform on Google+. This is an internal tool which we've been running votes for about two years. Uh, at this point, 11,000 Googlers have voted using Google Votes and cast about 75,000 votes. Our, our biggest event has been the Micro Kitchen Fair, which is that, uh, that picture in the, in the corner there, where we had about 8,000 Googlers showed up and actually 4,600 Googlers voted, including a lot of people who weren't at the event but who saw the posts on Google Plus and vo voted after the event. So in fact, the entire 2014 Micro Kitchen lineup is based on on the vote from from the micro kitchen fair basically all the vendors show up and uh, everybody pitches their their stuff other things we've done votes on are for example like here at kirkland the halloween costume the hangouts t-shirt and uh voted on the name of say of the the troll cafe in in seattle so uh also we've done some products at the at the google store uh i don't know if the remote people will be able to see that see this but uh this is why I'm wearing these uh, very spiffy boots. Oh, there you go. So they're uh, very colorful. They they won over the rain jacket and uh, several other options. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about the voting methods themselves. So the simplest one is two choice voting or or yes no voting. And if you have only two choices, things things are simple and as soon as you get more than two choices, things get tricky. But two choices, you can just use majority rule. There's really only one algorithm that applies to two-choice voting. You add up the S's, you add up the no's, and one of them wins. Uh, that's about it. So I'm not really going to talk much more about uh, majority rule for, for the rest of this talk. The most common, uh, I think I'll, I'll take questions at the at the end especially since it's a little difficult for me to, to see remote people raising their hands. So the one of the most common forms of voting is plurality voting. In plurality voting, you can have multiple choices. And what you say is that whatever choice gets the most votes, votes wins. And people can only vote on one choice. So majority means greater than 50%. Plurality means more than any of the other choices. You can, you can put a little more information with a very similar method called approval voting. And in approval voting, you allow people to vote on multiple choices. It's still kind of the same checkbox approach. There is no way in approval voting to say your relative ranking of these things. I can't say that I like pizza more than chicken or, or vice versa. I can just say I approve of both of them. Then, oh, by the way, approval voting is the thing that's, that's most like plus ones or, or Facebook likes. You just kind of click on the things you you, you approve of. Uh, the next uh, slightly more powerful voting method is called ranked voting. And in ranked voting, you can give your explicit ordering of, of items. In this case, with Google Votes, you can drag the items to the right and drag them around and, and uh, set the, the exact ranking you want. Then the last method we're going to cover is score voting or range voting. And in this, you give each item a, a score. In this case, for Google Votes, we've implemented five-star voting. And each level has a label associated with it. We went with agree, strongly agree, versus neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Now, range voting has a few subtleties, such as what happens if somebody doesn't cast a vote. And in this, because I mean, if you think about something like like Amazon reviews, you might see something that has a very high high rating. It's got four or five stars, 
But you know, if only four people rated that thing, it doesn't really tell you that much. Maybe you'd rather have the thing that's got a thousand ratings on it. So the way I get around this problem in Google Votes is we just require everybody to rate, rate everything. So in a situation like this where spaghetti and Asian noodle salad have not been rated, they will be treated as one star. And in fact, it warns the user. It says, hey, by the way, these, these two things are about to be treated as one star so they can uh, know exactly what they're, they're getting into. So a few other features of Google Votes is, one of them is, is ballots. So this is it's kind of similar UI paradigm as the individual votes, but this is the food fair ballot. And in this case, we have 24 different categories, and each of these categories is, is a vote. For example, snacks, chips, where you vote on the various chips. So for the food fair, we had 25 categories and over 200 options. So we also have ways of navigating easily as you vote on one category and then, and then go to the next one. Uh, another big thing with Google Votes is the integration with G+. So it's very easy. After you vote, you have the option of sharing. And this is one of the reasons we've gotten very good turnout with Google Votes run votes, where typically within the first day or two of running a vote, you'll get, you can get hundreds or a couple thousand votes just because you get the, the viral effect that people vote and they like things, so they share and then they reshare to their buddies. Here, like for example, sharing uh, almonds. The other thing we do for Google Plus integration is we use the same widget that's used for Blogger, uh, which, which is also the, basically the same widget used for YouTube comment integration, although we, we use the Blogger kind of configuration to aggregate all of the Google Plus posts about the vote. So, which is nice because right when you're at the point of making the vote decision, you get to look and see what everyone else is chattering about. You can also restrict to just see the conversation from people in your circles. Okay, now to drill down a bit uh, more detail for the aspects of these different voting methods, we're going to take a very specific scenario and a specific sample and use and see how that same example plays out for different methods and algorithms. So here we have 12 people voting on six options on what drink do we want to serve for, say, Friday dinner. And to further simplify things, we've grouped the 12 people into four preference profiles. So all the people under NIA uh, vote exactly the same. So NIA effectively counts as four votes. So Google Votes is actually a liquid democracy voting system, which means that you can explicitly delegate your vote to other people. So what we've done here is that these three other people have delegated their vote to, to NIA, giving her a voting power of four. Uh, these examples will all work equally well with non-liquid democracy systems if we just imagine that we have four people with identical preferences. So we'll start by looking at, at everybody's true preferences. What do they really like? So Sherry, Sherry has an opinion on everything. I mean, she thinks has all six of the things. She has her, you know, likes water before aloe juice, et cetera. Whereas Lynn and Chuck have opinions on their three top favorites. And then the other three, they, they're all equivalent, basically just zero. Nia has opinions on the top two choices, but then she has this third choice, which is, but it's kind of a distant third choice. And I just put an asterisk next to it to indicate that she'll take hint water as above the other three, but not by much. She, she doesn't really like hint water much. And that, that will play out as we, we go forward. So let's look at what happens with this example with plurality voting. So basically everybody just does the only thing they can do, which is vote for their top choice. In this case, hint water, uh, vitamin water, and so forth. So everybody votes for their top choice. Just let the screen refresh here. And then we look at the results. So the results are actually not that great because what happened was we had eight people who actually preferred water of some sort and four people who preferred tea, but yet tea won because what we saw here was vote splitting. Uh, this is because all of the water people split their votes among three different water choices and they all lost. This is a big disadvantage of plurality voting. This is a, 
equivalent to the problem of spoiler candidates where you have two things that are similar and one candidate just kind of spoils the other one. The, the most famous example of that is probably the, the Bush-Gore-Nader election of, of 2000. So plurality has some, some major difficulties. Now let's see if what happens. Oh, let me just go back one thing. To, to note here that in terms of the preferences table, basically what we did is we just took the first row and we ignored all the other rows. So we just threw away a lot of valuable information, which is part of why we got a poor result. So approval routing, we're going to let more of the information get into the system. In this case, uh, for example, Sherry, who had an opinion on all six items, she decides that the top four of those six items are things that she approves of. The whole concept of approve, disapprove is somewhat, somewhat um, up to the individual. But we kind of, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. Let's see, we'll show what that means. The other voters, they all approve of their top two choices. And then let's look at what happens. So effectively, what we've done here is we've taken everybody's preferences and we've drawn a, a, a kind of jagged line through the middle where everybody takes their top choices and they approve of them and their bottom choices and they disapprove. And all of their top approval choices get equal weight of, of one vote. So we see what happens here is that mineral water wins. Now this is actually a pretty good result in the sense of mineral water is a pretty good compromise for this group of people. If we kind of look at the top set of votes and kind of what's a, a decent mix. So in this case, um, fairly happy with what approval voting gave us here. And it didn't take that much difficulty for people to just check a bunch of boxes. Now we're going to go with ranked voting. So here we add in a lot more information. And so we this case, we go to Sherry. Now, remember, Sherry had had opinions on all six of the options. So, so she's happy. She gets to put in exactly what she feels, which is ranks them one through six. Then uh, Lynn and Chuck, they put in their three choices. And then we, we come to, to Nia. Now, Nia has a little bit of a dilemma here in that she, she clearly ranks her first two choices. Her third choice, she's not quite sure whether to rank it or not. She doesn't really like hint water much, but she says, well, I like it better than those other three guys. So, so she does drag it over to the right and, uh, and vote on it. What happens? Actually, let me. So now we get into the distinction between methods and algorithms. Because up till now, all the voting methods had a pretty clear thing to do, which is you just add everything up and you compare, compare the winners. It's, it's simple. But with ranking, it's not so clear. You kind of have all these preferences from a bunch of different people, and you got to merge them all together and make an output, uh, output ranking. So there's, there's different algorithms you can use for the same input data. First one we're going to look at is called uh, the board account. So in the 1700s, there was a gentleman named Jean-Charles de Borda who was uh, he's very accomplished. He was a military officer, a sailor, a mathematician, a physicist, and a political scientist. And he popularized this algorithm, which, which bears his name. The idea in board account is that uh, here we have six options. So what we do is we assign a range of six possible point values from 0 to 5, and we just give each person's ranking 0 to 5, depending on wh where they fit in the ranking here. So we add it all up. Hint water wins with 43 points, clear win over, over mineral water. So now let's think about this board account a bit. There's a few things that are kind of weird about board account. First, we're going to introduce this concept from social choice theory of irrelevant alternatives. So an irrelevant alternative is something that someone, someone or, a, or a choice that goes into the race that has no chance of winning. In this case, we're going to throw in Dr. Pepper and Coke. Now, only one person votes for it, Nia, and they're not even her first choice. So you can see what happens to the board account 
as soon as we add Dr. Pepper and Coke. They just end up at the very bottom. They don't really do anything. But yet, let's imagine that we were going to serve the top two drink choices. Just by introducing these guys at the bottom, they managed to switch around item two and item three. So mineral water got kicked out of second place and dropped into third place just because of these things that should be irrelevant. So, and, and you can kind of see the intuition from the table. You can see how Dr. Pepper and Coke just pushed mineral water down the table a few things, which, which knocked off some points. So this is uh, one indication that Borda count has some problems. Another thing is let's look again at who won border count. So border count, the, the first and second choices were hint water and mineral water with 43 points and 35 points respectively. And border count, it looks like hint water had a pretty good lead. I mean, there's not that many voters and 43 is quite a bit above 35. But let's, you know, the one thing we, everyone agrees on in voting is two item elections. You know, I said, if there's just two options, it's easy. You just vote and you add them up. It's a majority rule. So what happens if we just think about mineral water and hint water? Now with the same input data, we can just ignore everything except hint water and mineral water and make uh, two choice votes for everybody. So Sherry, for example, clearly votes for hint water, Lynn, hint water, Chuck and Nia both like uh, mineral water more. And if you add it up this way, you actually find that mineral water beats hint water, which is another indication that uh, Borda has, has some problems. Now, going back to the 1700s again, there's another, another gentleman named uh, Marquis de Condorcet, who is uh, actually a rival of Borda. So they're kind of, I think, kind of lifelong rivals debating uh, aspects of, of uh, political science. And he is famous for what's known as the Condorcet fam family of, of algorithms. So with Condorcet voting, you kind of take this pairwise concept and you dial it up. You get, the, you get the matrix of pairwise comparisons between everything. So in this case, we look at mineral water. And we saw from the previous slide that uh, mineral water versus hint water gave uh, seven to five, and mineral water beats hint water. And in fact, we can do the same thing with all of the other options. And mineral water pairwise beats, beats everybody. So we say that mineral water is a Condorcet winner. And uh, it's not shown on this slide, but, but Google Votes actually does the entire matrix. And you'll see that like hint water beats vitamin water, coconut, and honesty in pairwise comparisons, as well as vitamin water beats everybody below it in pairwise comparisons. So uh, the Condorcet winner is, is pretty nice. Also, again, notice that the Condorcet algorithms all give mineral water as the winner. And as I said, said earlier, mineral water is arguably the best the best uh, winner for this particular example kind of makes you know a good compromise. So let's let's look at another example of Condorcet voting. This is a simpler one where we only have three users voting on three options. And let's you know let's look at say bean versus Greek. Well we can see Lynn prefers bean to Greek. Chuck prefers bean to Greek, Nia, Greek to bean, add it up, and you can see the bean beats Greek six to four. However, Greek beats potato, and potato salad beats bean salad. So we have, we have a cycle here. There is no Condorcet winner for this specific example. And um, that's known as Condorcet's paradox. He, he, he wrote about it and uh, popularized it. So that's why the Condorcet algorithms, it's considered a family of algorithms, because there are a number of voting algorithms that are Condorcet compliant. And all Condorcet algorithms have the property that if there is a Condorcet winner, it'll be elected. But otherwise, they have different behavior. So in Google Votes, we implemented an algorithm called the Beat Path or the Schultz al algorithm. This, is, uh, this algorithm is used by a number of organizations. For example, Debian Linux actually has this algorithm written into their constitution. You can go on their web page, dig through the appendix on the Debian Linux constitution, and you'll find it's basically pseudocode to implement the BPATH algorithm. 
This algorithm is also called Schwartz sequential dropping, which is a slightly different variation that is guaranteed to always give the same results, and, and that's what they have written down. Uh, so the way beat path works is that we look at all these pairs, and for each pair, not only do we see who won, but we see how much did they win by. For example, bean versus Greek, is that six to four, so we'll call that uh, an edge of strength two. Greek versus potato, seven to three, we'll call that edge of strength four, and the other one also an edge of strength four. So what we do is when we compare two options, is we look at all the paths between them and find the strongest one, whereas each path is as strong as its weakest link. So between Greek and bean in this very simple example, it's plus two direct, but indirectly it gets plus four. So in fact, Greek beats bean in this example. And then since potato beats bean, we have uh, a ranking of Greek, potato, and bean. So, so the beat path does guarantee a aggregate ordering unless there's exact ties, in which case it gives you the exact ties, which is, which is what you want. Now, earlier we talked about the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Now, beat path is not actually um, guaranteed to, to follow independence of irrelevant alternatives, but it has a slightly weaker property called Smith IIA. And the Smith set is basically the set of Condorcet you know, the, the tied winners for first, according to Condorcet. So if you've got a whole bunch of options and you take all the options that will beat everybody else head to head and um, beat path guarantees that if you throw any irrelevant alternatives that aren't in that set, they won't mess up anybody who is in that set. So it's, it's stronger than Borda in that regards, in which case. In Borda, you can make examples where irrelevant alternatives can actually kick the, the first place winner out. Um, I'm, now it turns out that for an algorithm like this, it's actually impossible to make, uh, to satisfy independence of irrelevant alternatives. And in the 1950s, an economist named Kenneth Arrow uh, popularized something called, which is now known as the Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. And it says that there's kind of these common sense things you'd like a voting algorithm to have, and it turns out you can't have all of them at the same time. So if you have a voting algorithm that's just ranking, so it's, it's not something like score voting, but just a ranking, uh, all the inputs are rankings, then you know, there's these kind of common sense things like, like more than two choices. Unrestricted domain, that means that everybody can vote for whatever you want. You don't limit people's voting choices. Non-dictator means that there's no one voter who controls it all, who says that if, if this voter puts A above B, then A is always above B in the results. So no dictators. The other one is monotonicity, which is kind of a, an intuitive thing, that if I take a, a, a consistent set of votes and, and I, I raise up one of, my, one of my candidates, that should cause that candidate to either stay the same or raise up. It should not cause that candidate to go down. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm don't like uh, instant runoff voting. I mean, instant runoff voting, you can do weird things like you don't vote and you actually, things are better if you didn't show up to vote. There's weird cases, much less you change, you raise someone in your rankings and it causes them to do worse. So um, I'm not a fan of instant runoff voting. And then, then there's in independence of irrelevant alternatives that we talked about before. So you, you, you really just can't have your cake and eat it too with ranking algorithms. The um, last type of algorithm we're going to talk about is range and score voting. So going back to our example, we see that, uh, so we're going to start by looking at Nia. And remember, she had two strong first choices and then kind of a distant third choice. So, so Nia likes this system because she gets to put honest tea with five stars and mineral water with four stars, and then put a little distance between that and hint water, which she gets to mark as disagree and, and say that that's two levels down, not just one level down, and then put everything else at one star, the lowest rating. So uh, it's, it's more expressive in that regard. However, for Sherry, who has opinions on all six of the things, it, she has a different situation. In this case, she has six rankings, but there's only five stars. So she, she runs out of stars and is forced to put two of her options in the same bucket. She chooses to put her middle options 
as, as three stars. So vitamin water and mineral water both get three stars in her thing. And then the other two, they just kind of fill it in with five stars, four stars, and three stars for their, their top three choices. And uh, what, what happens at the end? Well, the algorithm we're using is averages for, for Google votes, and that's, that's a pretty common one. It's also the same type of thing you'll, you'll see on like Google, Google ratings pages, which have five stars, um, and, and you know Amazon or Netflix, things like that. So we see that mineral water wins with 3.33 stars. And again, uh, pardon me. Again, mineral water is is probably the best winner. So this is you know it did a, it did a pretty good job here. So let me add a, a few more caveats of range and score voting. One is that uh, approval voting is just a a special case of range and score voting. So in approval voting. It's just a score where your only scores are 0 and 1. Uh, then another caveat is that notice, notice what Nia did. Nia was honest, and she voted her true preference. But in this case, she would have actually been better if she had done what is called tactical voting, where people don't vote their true preference. They vote hoping that by lying about their preference, they will get the outcome that they want. Um, I mean, this, is, this is very common in plurality voting, where people don't bother voting for a third-party candidate because they think they have no choice of winning, even if they, they like the third-party candidate more. So in this case, she voted for Hintwater, but that actually gave Hint, Hintwater a little more support. And you'll see that Hintwater almost won. So she would have been better off if she had given Hintwater one star and uh, been less honest about her rankings because she'd have less chance that that one of her first two choices would um, would get kicked out. Now there is another common algorithm used for range score voting, which is called majority judgment. And in this case, you compute the median scores instead of the average scores. So for mineral water example, we would take up the number of five stars, four stars, three stars, et cetera, the distribution and find the median, and then we'd say, okay, that's what mineral water gets. And then any time two uh, choices have the same median value, you compare them, and you just start removing votes from each of their medians until one of them has a medium that cha median that changes. And uh, that's how majority judgment work. Uh, supposedly, there's some properties of majority judgment that make it more resistant to tactical voting. I'm not real familiar with it, in this specific example, majority judgment gives the exact same rating as averages. So whether you use medians or averages, it wouldn't uh, affect this specific example. To summarize, and this is, this is an opinion slide, because social choice theory has people with very strong opinions on one algorithm over another, and I'm going to disown you. You're no child of mine if you're using instant runoff voting or something like that. You know, <laughs> I saw thumbs up in the audience. I agree with that. So my opinions, uh, first, plurality voting, it, it's awful. It's a, it's a travesty that we er elect major world leaders using plurality voting. It's just massive distortions. There's a lot of argument to be said that the entire two-party system is purely an artifact of plurality voting because third parties can't get in, and it forces people to go after one of the winners, and it makes one of the winning two parties become more polarized because that's the only way they can they can get the votes. So it's it's got lots of problems, but it's easy to implement. Everyone understands it, so everybody does it. Okay, um, the Borda algorithm. Some people swear by it. I'm not that convinced. Obviously, from my talk, you, I haven't been giving very many arguments for why it is a good thing. There are a couple properties of Condorcet algorithms where every Condorcet algorithm fails it, and you can have Borda pass it, but um, I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of Borda. So approval voting is pretty good. I mean, if you need a lot of things, you need it done quickly with, with little cognitive overhead, give people multiple choice. So for, the, um, for example, for the food fair, we had 200 something options. You know, we wanted to just throw a bunch of options at people and they just click what they like and then go to the next screen. And, and we, got, we got decent results. 
Um, BeatPath is a pretty good uh, is a good algorithm when you want more fidelity than approval because approval you can't actually say I like this more than this. Um, if it's just kind of my default algorithm, I'd go with BeatPath. Beat for if just when in doubt, give people a ranking thing and um, use BeatPath. It'll give you a pretty good result. A range and score voting. One thing I didn't mention about that is that it's it's very good when there's an external standard such as Olympic diving. You know, everybody holds up their their slide that says 8.7. And in this case, for Olympic diving, the judges aren't really voting on which diver do they like the best. They're saying this specific dive is an 8.7. And 8.7 means something across all dives everywhere, anywhere, not just this single competition. So with range score voting, it's particularly good for that type of thing. Um, also earlier when I mentioned that Sherry couldn't fit all her votes into the five stars, that that's not a strict property of range score voting. Like if, if you do like Olympic judging with, you know, 10.2, I mean, there's, you know, you've got two digits, you know, as long as you've got less than 100 divers competing, it should be plenty of values for you to, to have that. And then my, my last opinion is that, uh, Yes, please use Google Votes for your group's decisions. It's particularly good for things like you want to choose a t-shirt or where you're going to have your team dinner. So to conclude, uh, I wanted to give a thanks to the, the Google Votes team. And, it, and uh, my co-lead is uh, Greg Wolf in San Francisco. The other major engineering de developer is Leo Lopez in uh, Brazil. She, she did most of the pretty UI stuff. And then also a special thanks to Courtney Nelson, who has been with us for the last two years in workplace services, coordinating uh, numerous votes with different groups of people, setting things up, answering people's questions, and, and uh, giving us customers. And then thanks to all of the other members of workplace services and other people who have uh, contributed to either code or UX design over, over the last couple of years. So next week, I'll be giving another talk which is purely about liquid democracy. It's all about the uh, delegated voting, what happens when you can flow votes through a, a graph, your social graph, uh, both the user experience uh, ramifications as well as the, the graph algorithms. So, um, okay, so thank you for your time and uh, we'll, we'll end a few minutes early, bye.